All right, so this is going to be the last video in this lecture on recurrent neural networks. So we are now talking about implementing an RNR classifier, RNN classifier in PyTorch. So the many to one word RNN that we just talked about in the previous video. So it will be essentially this whole process from going from a text to building a vocabulary, then this integer representation, and then using an embedding to get this input to the RNN, which will be, when you recall, be this one uh, many to one RNN where we have one sentence as an input and one class label as the output. So I have actually two codes here. One is an LSTM and one is a packed LSTM. The packed LSTM is just a more, implement, uh, more efficient implementation. So let's um, just talk about, um, let me hide this. Let's, um, talk about the regular LSTM first, the regular approach. So uh, it took yeah, a couple of minutes to run this. So I, I'm not going to rerun this. We are just taking a look at the results and I will upload this to GitHub if you want to play around with that. So we are going to use Torch or PyTorch and Torch text. So in particular, any version of Torch text that is 0.9 or higher. Um, also notice I don't have any helper files here because yeah, this is like a tricky concept to explain. I wanted to keep everything in this notebook to make it a little bit more yeah, easy to explain by walking you through this instead of visiting different files. But yeah, you could technically also use these helper files when code becomes larger. So here the training function will be very simple. I don't have any yeah, um, fancy training function this time just to keep things simple because I think an RNN is already complicated enough. So compared to a convolutional network, these RNNs are actually really tricky to implement, at least in my opinion. I actually very much prefer working with convolutional networks. So here are some general settings. So we are going to use a vocabulary size capped at 20,000. The learning rate, batch size, number of epochs, this is something familiar to you. The embedding dimension that we will use is 128. The hidden dimension will be 256. This is like um, after that. And then the number of classes is two. So first we're going to download the data set, the IMDB movie review data set. So here in this, uh, in this part, we are downloading it from uh, my book because, yeah, just for simplicity, because this will save us some pre-processing steps. There is actually an IMDB dataset implemented in Torch text, but um, here I'm also explaining to you how you can use an LSTM on your own dataset. So it's basically two steps in one. And we are using this because it's in CSV format that is already, I would say, easy to use. So we can skip all the pre-processing steps of this particular data set so that we can more focus on how Torch text works. So this is just um, downloading it from this GitHub repository. Then uh, this is unzipping it. And then this is loading it into a, a pandas data frame because yeah, it's just a little bit simpler than using anything else. So this is a CSV file. So we are using pandas to take a look at it. So it has, uh, I think, 50,000 entries. So yeah, these are the first five. The review is the text, the input text, and the sentiment is the class label. Um, it's kind of, to, personally to me, a common gotcha to uh, have the wrong names later in the code. So here I'm using something called a text column name and label column name as the name for these because uh, you will see that later you have to provide kind of like uh, an attribute access to these features in the training loop and the same for the labels so depending on the names of your columns in the pandas data frame your training loop might look different you have to rewrite it and i find this very tedious so I would give my pandas data frame, if I have work different data sets, always these names just to keep it simple. It could be something else, but I find it um, also in capital letters uh, useful. So it reminds me what this means or what this is. It's just easier to see it just screams out. Okay, this is a column name here. And this is important. All right, so I'm just giving it the generic name text column name and the generic name label column name here. 
All right, and then I'm deleting this again. So here I was just essentially loading it, renaming it and saving it again. And then uh, here, this is just for taking a look at it again, that it looks okay. And then I'm deleting it because I'm not using it here anymore. Then we are going now to prepare this data set with torch text as input to the RNN. For that, we are going to use a library that is called Spacey. Spacey is a very popular natural language processing library for Python. And in particular, we are using the tokenizer. So by default, it would use a uh, tokenizer splitting on white spaces. But uh, I heard from people working with real world data sets that sometimes these are not very robust to, let's say, weird characters. So um, also HTML characters and things like that. And this tokenizer also gets rid of certain formatting things you find in HTML, like these, um, these symbols here and so forth. So it's like a little bit more sophisticated than just splitting on white space. So what this is doing is it's splitting uh, yeah, a text into white space so that one token is one word. And we are using here this um, English language. It's I think it stands for English, core, web, and something. <laughs> I'm not, this is not for something, I'm just saying something, I forgot what this means. But this is essentially a library, or not a library, a um, dictionary for English words and web, uh, th things encountered on, in, on websites and stuff like that. So this is usually useful if you yeah, just work with a data set like scrape from somewhere on the internet. Um, if you are just running this, it may be that you encounter, will encounter an error. So you have to run this one first, which will, you have to run this on the command line. This will download this um, yeah, dictionary here. And yeah, to install Spacey, I recommend Conda, but you can also use pip, pip install. Now, like I said before in the previous video, things have changed um, in Torch Text. So we are going to use the old way called torchtext.legacy. Torch but if you want to convert this to the new one, I actually spent a lot of time yesterday and then it was not working very well. So I um, used the old way again. But if you're interested here, there's a tutorial for migration on the slides. So to migrate to the newer way that it doesn't use this legacy thing. All right, so we are now defining a field for the text. So this will be our features, our tokens. So this these will be, so if we have, for instance, um, oops, if we have this text here, this will be something like um, a list containing of, containing these, consisting of these words split by approximately something like the white space, but a little bit fancier than that. But each entry in the list will be one word essentially using this tokenizer. All right, the second one is the label. So this is um, for designating this label, which will be a integer. Long, long is just a 64-bit integer. Here we are providing these fields. And this is, so we are providing these fields, which are the text that we have defined here and the label that we have defined here. And we are using this tabular data set, which will read our CSV file and then parsing out these things so that we will can then load them uh, as a data loader. So here, this is why it's, uh, so here, this is important. This name has to be the name that is actually here. And personally, it's, that is where I always make mistakes. So I, let's say, don't rename it. If I don't rename it, I would have to put in like, Oops, I would have to put in review here and then sentiment here. And then later I have to also use these words. And if I have a predefined um, training loop, I would have to rewrite certain things depending on what data set I use. This is why at the beginning I renamed the column so I can always uh, leave it like it is right here now. The only thing I have to change is of course the path to my data set. All right, and in this case, it doesn't have a header. So you also have to check um, here in this case, there is no header row. There are only the column names, but there's no, no particular header row. Oh wait, sorry, there is you know skip header. There's no header row, it's skipping the header. Okay, so it's skipping, skipping these, sorry. What I meant is it has a header, it has these column names and it's skipping those. Okay, 
So this is now the way we process our CSV file into a data set. Next, we want to have a training and a test data set. So I'm using this split function. I'm splitting this data set into two, a training and a test data set. Actually, I try to split it into three directly. It should technically support that. So I had something like 0.7, 0.1 and 0.2 but it gave me some very weird results I think it's a bug um, so because what happened was I had a validation set like this train data validation data and test data for some reason I don't know why the validation data was much bigger than a test data which should be the opposite and I tried many things it seems to be a bug so I do it in two steps first step is I'm splitting the training data, or the data set into training data, 80% and 20% test data. So I'm double checking here. So the data set consists of 50,000 data points. 40,000 will be for training, 10,000 will be for testing. And then I split the training data further into a training data set again and validation data. So in total, what I will have is 34,000 training examples, 6,000 validation examples, and 10,000 test examples. Just to make sure everything looks okay, we are now taking a look at the first training example. So zero index zero is the first training example, and this is how it looks like. So text column name, that is the tokenized, so this is using the tokenizer, this is the tokenized review text. You can see it keeps punctuation, it keeps numbers. So for some unknown reason, comma, seven years ago, comma, I watched blah, blah, blah. So you can see, um, yeah, this is now the tokenized text. This is from using the spacey tokenizer. And also there's the cum name here. This is like the, um, this should be the class label. Actually not sure why this is not an integer. Later actually it doesn't cause any problems, so it seems to be okay, but I feel like this should be without quotation marks, but anyways. All right, so now we have the data sets, the training data, validation data, and the test data. What we are now doing is we are building the vocabulary. So here, build vocab. I'm setting a maximum size for the vocabulary because you have to prevent overfitting. So we are only using the most um, used words, the 20,000 most frequent words. So I defined the vocabulary size here somewhere at the, at the top. You can play around with that. You can use 10,000, 25,000, 30,000. It depends a little bit on how big the training set is and how, yeah, how diverse the data points are, the, texts are, how long the texts are, but 20,000 is a good number to start with. So we are building this now. And uh, for some reason, it's also called build vocab here. I think I'm doing it right. Um, so vocabulary size, what we will find is it's 20,002, not 20,000. And this is because we have the unknown word token so if we encounter an unknown word that it will not crash and then also the ones for padding and we have two classes zero and one here i'm now showing the just to look at whether it makes sense actually i can see there is something that i feel like shouldn't be there this is this break character here uh, i thought to be honest the spacey tokenizer would be a little bit more robust that it would not have these types of things but oh well happens it's probably not perfect. So here we are looking at the 20 most frequently encountered words so, or tokens. So the is very frequent, the comma is frequent, point is the punctuation, and, and so forth. But yeah, this kind of bothers me. <laughs> this shouldn't be here. So we would, uh, in a real world application, probably have to deal with that using a different tokenizer or maybe just stripping it out before we pass it to the tokenizer or something like that. All right, next, um, tokens corresponding to the first 10 indices, just to look at those. So we have our vocabulary that is of size 20,000. So if I go back to my um, 
my slides. So we have this vocabulary um, and we are now looking one, two, three, four, five, the different uh, integers the strings correspond to. So the first entry in my vocabulary is this unknown one. The second one is the padding and then the, the comma, point, the end, a, o, f and so forth. And just for I don't know, just making sure things work technically so we will use that later for making predictions but later, uh, later uh, generally we can also just take this vocabulary for the text field and convert any word into this uh, integer corresponding to the dictionary so the in the according to this vocabulary the word the is at index position two so zero one two so here we are putting it in and get the number two so this is all we are here currently this is not necessary we are just investigating what's going on just to make sure things look okay oh yeah i see so yeah we have now this um class label vocabulary and i mentioned earlier there shouldn't be uh strings i mean this is probably because yeah we could have here we could have put the word pos or neck for positive or negative this is what's original in the movie review database so here i in in my book i converted it to one and zero already and the code thinks these are yeah um, strings kind of funny so it's mapping one to zero and zero to one so we would have to keep that in mind when we later do the prediction so we could have um just used words like uh, pos and negative and stuff like that uh, we could also yeah, we could also change that if we wanted to. It's just um, here, it's just, I think, alphabetical order or something like that. Well, it can't be alphabetical. I think it's just what it has encountered first or something, or maybe it's even random. We just have to remember that the um, string one in our label column corresponds to the class label zero in, in the uh, tensor later. Then here is uh, frequency count of the vocabulary, uh, sorry, of the training data points. So we have approximately 60,000 corresponding to zero. And this one is actually negative, zero is negative, and one is positive, and 70,000 positive ones. Um, one more thing I wanted to say is, let's, yeah, here, I'm building the vocabulary only on the training data not on the whole data set because as usual we pretend that the validation and test data are unseen that there are new data sets that's what we use for yeah, evaluating our model during training we pretend we don't know these it's like independent data so we are only building um, the vocabulary based on the known data the training data all right <laughs> so you can see it's really complicated to implement an RNN. There are lots of steps involved. It's way more complicated than a convolutional network. So if you don't really understand everything the first time, it's totally normal. It's just, it is very complicated. People study this for uh, many months to before they become comfortable using those things. Um, now we are implementing the training validation and test loader. We use something called a bucket iterator, which is a special iterator in PyTorch Torch text, which will group um, the batches such that the sentences have similar length and that reduces the number of padding that is required. Okay, um, here now we are testing whether those work actually, these data loaders. And you can see what I'm just doing is I'm like before in my other code examples, I'm just doing four batch in train loader and then I print these and then I do a break so it only shows the first batch. I just want to see if, if it runs okay. So you can see for the first batch, it's actually pretty large. Uh, I should say the first value here is the sentence length and the second one is the batch size. So this is a little bit different from the convolution networks where we had the batch size first. This is what makes, I feel like, everything also a little bit complicated to understand. It's like that the sentence uh, length here is first. And the sentence length is um, these integers here, th these here. So I have a better one here. 
yeah this this is basically the sentence um well this is for one word sorry um yeah i don't have a good one here in the lecture notes but so if you concatenate these um, together this would be um the sentence length and then this is the batch size i think yeah All right, um, so now the R and N here. So the R and N, oh, okay, sorry. Let's just uh, have to make this a bit bigger here. So the R and N looks like as follows. We're actually using an LSTM. So there are several things now. We are using this embedding that provides the input to the LSTM then the LSTM itself, and then the output layer, hidden layer. Uh, sorry, the output layer, it's not a hidden layer. Um, this you can think of, of the LSTM, you can think of as the hidden layer. Whereas, yeah, okay, the embedding comes before that. It's like preparing the input for the hidden layer. Actually, in the slides, I said it's this one, but then there would be another matrix. So it's uh, technically a little bit confusing. I should have actually not done that. I should have showed you it as a uh, embedding that comes before that, that prepares these axes. And this, this W technically belongs to the RNN hidden layer, if we would implement this one here. And the LSTM has a more complicated setup, as you recall from last time. So it has all these um, different types of hidden layers here. Okay. Mm, now, what we have here is the embedding that converts the word into the real value vector. If I go back to my slides again, this is giving us this matrix here. So this goes from text to this integer vector to these embeddings. And then the LSTM takes in this embeddings and produces the hidden activations. And then this is just like a classification layer, like in a multi-layer perceptron or the last layer of a convolutional layer. This goes from the hidden dimension to the class labels. So output dim is the number of class labels. Now, these are defined here. We can't use um, easily a sequential like we did before because there's a little bit um, the output looks a little bit different. So I'm also um, maybe I should say you can technically use an RNN instead of the LSTM, but you will find the performance is relatively poor. So you probably want to use an LSTM, but if you want to do some experiments, you can actually use the RNN instead of the LSTM. The LSTM is essentially um, yeah, what I showed you before in the last uh, two, two videos ago, the LSTM hidden layer. Okay, the forward pass gets a text. So this gets really the um, text. This goes through the embedding. Um, and then the embedding is the input to the LSTM. So I called it RNN, but it's the LSTM. And it outputs the output the hidden and the cell state. So mm, I'm just looking for a good uh, slide here. So we have this many to one here. And the um, should probably focus on many uh, one to many or many to many. Okay, so let's let's consider this many to many here. When I call the LSTM, it will output so the orange one you can think of as, as the LSTM. It will output something that goes to the output. I think I had a better slide somewhere here. Yeah, here. So it will output this Y and it will output the hidden state for the next hidden layer. So this is um, the output is the Y. This is the Y. Hidden is what goes here in this arrow, what goes to the next one. 
and cell state is specific to the LSTM. That's this uh, LSTM state. Okay, so um, let me scroll here. So we have the cell state that is output here, right? So this one here. Then we have this is the Y here to next layer where it says to next layer. This would be the Y. This would be the output. And HT, this would be the hidden. And cell, this would be this CT. It is complicated. So if it doesn't make sense immediately, uh, it is a complicated concept. So since we have let me find a better representation here again. Since we have uh, many to one, we are not going to use these here. So we are not going to use this one and this one. So this one we are not going to use. This one is not we are not going to use. And this one is kind of also included in this output. So to make s things simpler, we are going to use actually um, let me draw an arrow. So what we are going to use here is we are going to use the hidden output from the last one, which is this hidden here. And then we will provide our own hidden layer, our own output here. Instead of using this green one, we will have our own fully connected here, fully connected layer. This is what we're doing here. So we are computing our own output. We are removing this. It's, let's say, too complicated. We don't want to use all, all these green ones. We are going to only use the hidden one, which is the output of this orange here, of the last orange, and then have our own fully connected layer to get this output here. This is what's going on here. All right, I hope this makes somewhat sense. So if we look at the um, sizes, we go from sentence length to batch size. This is like what we had before, sentence length and batch size, the matrix of our input. Then this goes uh, into the embedding layer, which produces a sentence length, batch size, embedding dimension. This is our, I don't know why it is arranged like that, but this is our, um, let me delete this so we, so I don't save it later when I export it for you. Um, yeah. So this will be this is the um, oops, this is the embedding. This is the embedding matrix. This is the embedding for one training example. We have some. We have uh, multiple because we have a batch size, and the batch size dimension is between the embedding and the sentence length. So the sentence length length would be the rows here. Here it's also the rows and the uh, columns is here not the embedding dimensions, it's the batch size. So we have sentence lengths, batch size and embedding. So the, you have to think there would be an additional dimension here. And then this goes sentence length, batch size, hidden dimension. This is um, the dimensionality of our hidden layer. We chose, I think, 256 and then we what we output get is uh, there's only one. So hidden is one because it's the last one, only the last one. It's the dimension is batch size and hidden dimension. This is usually what would go into the next hidden layer. And we want to give it to all, we, like I said before, we make our own output layer. This is our fully connected layer, this one. So we are removing here with squeeze, we are removing this one. So we make this a uh, batch size times hidden dimension. And this is something you have seen before all the time when we use the multilayer perceptron and the convolutional network. This is a squeeze is just, we are saying remove the first dimension, the one here, so that it is compatible with our linear layer here. Um, again, this is complicated stuff. Uh, so if that doesn't make sense, um, you don't have to memorize any of this. Uh, I can totally understand if this is com complicated. To be honest, I also spent several hours just implementing this. It's um, it's not easy, it's complicated. And if you really want to work with text, of course, uh, 
watching this one lecture gives you just the introduction. It's normal to spend weeks or months or professionals spend years uh, really um, doing all these things. There are many, many aspects to working with text. This is just the introduction, so don't feel bad if this looks a little bit complicated to you. It naturally takes time to work with this uh, and yeah, to get a better grasp of what's going on here. Okay, but moving on, so we initialize now our recurrent neural network. The input dimension is equal to our vocabulary size. That's the 20,002. So we use that here in our, to create our embedding matrix. Then the embedding dimension, we had something like 128. Then the hidden dimension is 256. And number of classes, we have two. We set it to two. So if I scroll up to the top, we set it to two here. Hidden dimension 256, embedding 128. We could technically use just one class and then use a logistic sigmoid instead of softmax function. And then we could use the binary cross entropy loss instead of the regular cross entropy loss in PyTorch. I did that at first, but then I was thinking maybe you would like to use this code here as a template for some other classification problem that is not a binary one. And then you would have to rewrite everything. So I implemented it here with two output nodes, although it's redundant. I implemented it so that you can adopt it to your own data set. So I thought it's more useful in this way so you don't have to rewrite any code if you want to use that for your project. Um, all right, so now let's get, so this is um, initializing the model. I'm just using Adam. Now let's get to the part where we have the training. So here's the accuracy function for computing the accuracy. So yeah, so here we are just um, computing the accuracy and here that's the training. Interesting, um, I should have, yeah, I could have also done it like that. But so to be clear here, how this works is I have batch index and batch data. So here I did it a little bit differently. So yeah, I already unrolled this, it seemed to work. But yeah, so here I have batch index and batch data. So it's the training loop, I'm iterating over the epochs, setting my model to train mode, and then I'm iterating over the data loader. And it gives me two things, the text, which is batch data dot text column name, and labels, which is batch data dot label column name. This is why I earlier renamed the columns. Then I'm providing here the logits. This is the output from the model. So we give the text to the model and it will do the embedding for us and then run it through the LSTM. And out come the logits, which is just like the logits in the multilayer perceptron or the convolutional network that we have seen before. And we have the labels here. The labels is our sentiment. And this is exactly how we've seen that before. There's nothing new here. And yeah, it trains. Um, actually, I was training it and I noticed, okay, it's not really working, right? You can see it doesn't really work. And I was like really frustrated because I spent many hours implementing this and then it didn't work. But then for some reason, it picked up training here and the performance got really good. So at the end, I had a test accuracy of 84%. Then also to make sure I should have used the same dictionary. I don't know why I didn't do that um, for uh, yeah, the tokenizer. Anyway, so here is just an example. This I took actually um, uh, modified it slightly. This is based on based on this tutorial here. I took it from here. So modified it a little bit for this code. This is just like an example of the things we have to do in order to put something into our text if we have new text. So let's say I have my model and I have a new text like this is such an awesome movie, I really love it. And I want to know whether it, what the probability that this is a positive review is. It turns out it's 98% positive, which is what we would expect. Um, so what did I do here? I put the model in evaluation mode. I tokenized the text. So yeah, um, so I'm tokenizing a text using this LMP tokenizer. I should have maybe used the same as above this um, web dictionary, but it worked just fine. Then I'm getting the integer representation, the length I don't need here. I need it for my other model. This is why I think I've just left it in here. 
Then I'm converting it to a long ten tensor and put it onto the GPU. That's where my model is. If it was on the uh, GPU, otherwise it will be on the CPU. If device is CPU, just an optional step if you trained on the GPU. Um, yeah, so this is the index tensor. And this index tensor will go to the embedding. Um, so the embedding will not do the text into the embedding. It will be two steps. So we have to prepare the indices. Um, okay. Yeah, and then that's the softmax because we don't have any softmax in our model ourselves. And yeah, this is just this predict sentiment function for putting in arbitrary text. And here is the same for the computing the probability that something is negative. It's just mi one minus this, right? So here, I really hate this movie. It is a really bad movie and sucks. And you can see model also detects that this is indeed a negative one. All right, so this is how it essentially works. So this is the LSTM, the regular LSTM. It's pretty complicated, as you have seen. You can actually make it even comp more complicated using this packed approach. So if you're interested in that, there is a, a very good explanation here. So essentially, it's about ordering the sentences and the batches to minimize the number of computations because we have to do a padding right and if you just shuffle your data set there will be randomly long and short sentences together but it is inefficient because uh, for some batches you have to pad a lot just because there are one or two long sentences so this packed approach what we will do is it will look at the whole training set and organize it such that it minimizes the number of padding required. So there are a few changes that you have to make for that. So um, I highlighted them here. So you have to include the length in the tokenizer and so forth. So some changes. One thing here where this um, sorting within the batch is also required. Mm. Yeah, and then here, that was what take, took me a long time to figure out. Uh, you have to use this uh, rnn.pack.padded sequences and then provide also the text length. It took me literally hours to figure that out. <laughs> it was kind of frustrating, but yeah. Anyways, <laughs> okay. So, and then I had to modify this a little bit in the accuracy function. In any case, long story short, uh, it trained. It trained actually very well. I didn't expect it to train that well. I'm not sure if there's a bug, but it trained so good actually, or so well, that it got 99% test accuracy. So essentially, this should be just the same as this one, but um, more efficient because it puts or organizes it so that we minimize the padding. Um, and it is also faster because of that. You can see if I go here for one epoch, it takes only 0.33 minutes. Whereas here it takes almost um, more than two times as much. And yeah, you can see it gets 99% test accuracy. I took a look at this. I can't find any mistake or bug. I think it's just a great uh, model here that trains well. It could be that there is a bug somewhere because this is a little bit suspiciously good. But yeah, well, I take it 99% doesn't sound too bad. So yeah, so here you have two templates. And um, based on what I've seen, actually, I think this one looked really good. So here you will have some additional resources uh, if you are really interested in working with text. But again, this is a very complicated topic. And uh, I don't blame you if this looks all complicated to you. So you are just learning about it probably for the first time. Um, people who work with natural language processing spend many, many yeah, days, weeks, months uh, learning these types of things. So here I gave you the overview. I hope it's um, it's useful. Next lecture, we will now then finally get to the generative modeling part. So now I gave you the introduction to the general machine learning and deep learning concepts. In the next lecture, we will take a look at deep learning models for yeah, generating new data, autoencoders, variational autoencoders, um, generative adversarial networks, 
And if we have time, maybe also transform us. All right, then um, see you on Thursday.